we are at the very beginning of history. Future generations will see us as the ancients living in the distant past. What are the events that really could have civilizational trajectory level impacts? And then finally taking action, trying to figure out, okay, what can we do to ensure that we navigate these challenges and try to bring about a wonderful future for our grandchildren and their grandchildren? Given the fact that we're seeing James Webb telescope images all over the place at the moment, kind of seems like a smart time to be thinking about far-flung futures and potentials for civilization and stuff like that. Absolutely. James Webb is making very vivid um, and in high resolution uh, an inc incredibly important fact, which is just that we are, at the moment, are both very small in the universe <laughs> Um, and also very early in it. So almost all of the universe's development is still to come ahead of us. That's wild to think about the fact, especially on our time scales, right? You know, you think about 20 years as being a very long time in a human lifespan, and then you start to scale stuff up to continents, to the size of a planet, to the size of a solar system or a galaxy or the universe, and it, it puts things into perspective. Yeah, well, we're used to long-term thinking being uh, on the order of a couple of decades or maybe a century at most. But really, that's being very myopic. Um, I mean, how long has history gone on for? Well, that's a couple of thousand years. Homo sapiens have been around for a few hundred thousand years. The Earth formed four billion years ago. First, um, the Big Bang was a little under 14 billion years ago. And if we don't go extinct in the near future, which we might do, and we might cause our own extinction, then we are at the very beginning of history. Uh, future generations will see us as the ancients living in the distant past. And to see that, we can just use some kind of comparisons. So a typical mammal species lives around a million years. We've been going for 300,000 years. That would put 700,000 years to come. So already on that by that metric, our life expectancy is very large indeed. But we're not a typical species. We can do a lot of things that other mammals can't. That creates grave risks, such as um, from engineered pathogens or AI that could bring our own um, demise. But it also means that if we survive those challenges, then we could last much longer again, where the Earth will remain habitable for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and if one, we one day take to the stars, well, the sun itself... Um, will uh, only stop burning in about 8 billion years, and the last stars will be shining in uh, 100 trillion years. So on any of these measures, humanity's life expectancy is truly vast. If you give just a 1% chance to us spreading to you know, the stars and staying as long as, uh, lasting as long as the stars shine, well, we've got a life expectancy of a trillion years. But even if we stay on Earth, the life expectancy is still tens, many tens of millions of years. And that just means that when we look to the future and when we think about events that might occur in our lifetime that could impact that future, that could change humanity's course, well, you know, we should just boggle at the stakes that are involved. And when you talk about long-termism, that is looking at the future as something which needs to be taken seriously. There is this sort of grand potential for human flourishing, for human life, for all of the good stuff that could occur for a very, very long time over a very, very wide distance. And we need to take it seriously. Exactly. Long-termism is about taking the interests of future generations seriously and appreciating just how big that future could be if we play our cards right and how good it could be. And then from there trying to think, okay, what are the things that could be happening in our lifetime, like engineered pandemics, like greater than human level artificial intelligence, like World War III, what are the events that really could have, you know, civilizational trajectory level impacts? And then finally taking action, trying to figure out, okay, what can we do to ensure that we navigate these challenges and try to bring about, a, you know, a wonderful future for our grandchildren and their grandchildren and their grandchildren and so on. It's nice to hear or to think that you've been focused so much on long-termism because I fell in love with The Precipice by Toby Ord that I know you work with. And anybody close that, friend of mine. He, he's phenomenal, man. But 
anybody that reads that book, especially the the beginning, the premise that he talks about, right? And the premise is he he believes that humanity is at a very particularly unique, dangerous inflection point in between sort of prehistory and our um, civilizational inheritance that we could continue on and, and, and be lovely and flourishing with. And in that first chapter, he talks about the fact that the huge, vast inheritance potential that we have downstream from us is it, it is crazily big. And yet, almost all of the things that we do now are focused on such a narrow time span. We're not thinking, even the most long-term of long-termism projections don't yeah. get into the hundreds of thousands or millions of years like you're talking about. Uh, exactly. We focus on this tiny window. And, you know, in many cases, that makes sense. You can't control what people in the year 3000 have for breakfast. Um, but surprisingly, there are things that we can affect now that do impact people in the year 3000, uh, where number one among those, which Toby talks about at length, uh, and where, you know, you can see the precipice and what we owe the future. My book is kind of compliments to each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, both plowing a very similar photo. Yeah. One of the things that Toby talks about, um, at length is ways in which we can cause our own extinction. Uh, so obviously asteroids, super volcanoes, there are natural risks that, uh, could wipe us all out. Thankfully, we've actually done a pretty good job, at least of navigating asteroids. Um, Space Guard and NASA program just came together, spent only on the order of about $5 million per year, um, but has basically eliminated the risk from asteroids. Uh, it's very, very unlikely that we now know it's very, very unlikely that we'll get um, hit by some kind of dinosaur killer uh, in the next few centuries. But we are creating new risks. So the era of nuclear weapons created an era of like new destructive power. And the next generation of weapons of mass destruction could be considerably worse again. Um, engineered pathogens could create uh, the ability to create, create new viruses that could kill you know, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, perhaps everyone on the planet. And if a you know, uh, large bioweapons program starts up uh, focused on such things, uh, and we have seen large bioweapons programs in the past, uh, that could be fairly dangerous indeed. Um, and that's exactly the sort of thing that we want to ensure goes to kind of zero as a, as a risk. So how are our actions now important? Is it about investing in uh, trajectories that people move down in the future? What, what difference does what we do in 2022 have in 2022? Yeah, so uh, I think there are two ways of impacting the long-term future. So one is ensuring we have a future at all, such as by reducing the risk of extinction or reducing the a chance of civilization just collapsing and then never recovering. A second way is by making the future better, assuming we do survive, improving kind of future civilization's quality of life. And on the first of these, uh, well, one thing we can do is carefully, carefully navigate new technologies. That can mean accelerating defensive technology, beneficial technology, and it can mean uh, putting in policy such that we either slow offensive technology or just choose not to build it. So on the accelerating offensive tech or def defensive technology. Uh, one thing, for example, is uh, far UVC lighting, where this is um, a certain small spectrum of light. Uh, if you implant the light into a light bulb and uh, it kind of irradiates a room, um, just as a normal light bulb does, then it also kills off the pathogens in that room. And this is very early stage research. But seems, you know, it's quite exciting. Um, I think with some foundations I advise, we're going to be uh, funding it uh, to a significant degree, where if this checks out, if it's sufficiently efficacious, if it's sufficiently safe, um, then we could launch a campaign to ensure that this is installed in all light bulbs all around the world. We would have made it, you know, very, very hard, near impossible to have another pandemic. Um, and along the way, would have eradicated uh basically all the spirits of disease. And, you know, that's pretty exciting. That's something that we can do um, by <coughs> taking these risks seriously to say, look, we can have an enormous benefit impact, not just on the present generation, but on the course of all future generations to come, creating a safer world for 
you know, the next generation. Is this a particularly crucial time, do you think, in the history of the future? Uh, yeah, I think there's good arguments for thinking that we're certainly at a very unusual time. Uh, I don't want to make the claim that we're necessarily at the very most important time. Perhaps the next century will be even more important. Um, and I think there were some hugely crucial times in the past as well. But we're at a very unusual time compared to both the history, both history and the future. One reason for this is just that the world is so interconnected. So for most of human history, um, or a large chunk of human history, there just weren't, wasn't a con global connection. There were people in the Americas, people in um, Asia and Africa, people in Australia, and they just didn't know each other at all. <coughs> Even within the landmass of Eurasia, you know, in the early, the first couple of centuries AD, the Han Dynasty and um, the Roman Empire they comprised about 30% of the population each, but they barely knew of each other. They were like, you know, tales that one would tell of a distant civilization. Whereas now we're global and we're interconnected. And that means that, say you have a certain message that you want to get out there. In principle, it can get out to the entire world. Or, in a, a, you know, more darkly, if you want to, you know, achieve conquest and domination, you can potentially do so over the entire world. And in the future, again, I mean, we were talking about galactic scale thinking and uh, the James Webb telescope. In the future, we'll be disconnected again. If one day we took to the stars, we're on different solar systems, then even to our closest solar system, there and back communication would take eight years. And at some point in the very distant future, well, actually different galactic groups will be disconnected such that you could never communicate between one another. another. Although, I'll caveat, that's very far away indeed, about 150 billion years. So hopefully we're still going by then, but no guarantees. Um, so that's one, the fact that we're just so interconnected is one way in which um, uh, the work, like one way in which the present time is so important. Um, and so, and, well, what I'm going to say is so unusual um, and seemingly important because it means that, you know, we can have this like battle of ideas and, um, competition between values and if one value system like took power then it would take power over everything and uh that's pretty you know it's potentially pretty worrying uh, a second way um in which the present is so unusual is just how fast technological progress is is happening so for almost all of human history when we we're hunter gatherers um economic growth uh which is you know one measure of technological progress uh was going about basically close to zero. Very, very slow um, accumulation of better stone tools, um, spear throwers, things like that. Uh, agricultural revolution meant that sped up a little bit, developed farming, better farming techniques, but we're still growing at about 0.1% per year. Over the last couple of centuries, we've been growing at more like 2 or 3% per year in the frontier economies. Now, can we keep that? And most of that growth is driven by technological advancement that enables us both to have more people and for those people to have better material quality of life. life. Now, how long can we keep that going for? Uh, you know, sometimes you get this idea of, oh, well, future science is just boundless. We can never, uh, never come to the end of it. But we've only been going properly for a few hundred years since the scientific revolution. And it seems to me hard, like if we go at this pace, well, at some point we'll have figured out pretty much everything there is to figure out. But we can think about this economically as well, where uh, if we keep growing at 2% per year, after 10,000 years, uh, civil, because of the power of compound growth, uh, civil, you know, the world economy, or the total economy, would be 10 to the power of 89 times current um, civilization. That's a very big number. And to put it in context, uh, there are only 10 to the power of 67 atoms within 10,000 light years. So we would need to have an economy a trillion times the size of the current world economy for every atom within reachable distance. And that's just extremely implausible. Um, I really just don't think that's possible. And so that suggests we're at this period of rapid technological growth and rapid technological advancement that cannot continue. And that means we're moving through the tech tree at an unusually fast rate. And that means just a lot of change. It also means that we're at a kind of unusually high density period in terms of 
developing technology that could be very important, used for good, or um, very harmful, you know, used either to lead to civilizational collapse, to end civilization, uh, or for to allow kind of certain ideologies to gain power and to influence how the course of the future goes. Early on in our history, we weren't moving sufficiently quickly to be able to develop anything that would be that much of a surprise because it was iterated at a much slower rate. Potentially, or it seems like further into the future, not only are we going to have such advanced technologies that any dangerous technologies can probably be mitigated at least a little bit, but also, again, it's going to slow down. You're going to have this sort of S-shaped curve, right? Like flat to a hockey stick to then yep. start to flatten off again. And at both of the relatively flat areas of that, not much change, which means, therefore, yep. a relatively low amount of risk. I'm going to guess this links in with uh, Nick Bostrom's ball from the urn thing, right? That there's just fewer balls that can be picked out of the urn when the change isn't occurring so quickly. Exactly. So if we're thinking, if we're asking, is now an unusually important time? Well, yeah. Uh, Nick Bostrom has this analogy of um, technological progress as like throwing balls from an urn and if you pick a green ball, then it's like a very good thing. If you pick a red ball, then it's a very you know bad thing. It's maybe it's even catastrophic. And we're picking balls from the urn just very quickly. Um, I mean, I'm actually not sure. Like most balls are both green and red, depending on which way you look at them. Uh, most technologies can be used for good or ill. Fission gave us nuclear reactors. It also gave us the bomb. Um, but you know, we're picking balls out of this urn at a faster rate than we did for almost all of humanity's history, or and that we will do for almost all of humanity's future, um, even if we don't go extinct in the next few centuries. What are you talking about when you say trajectory change? Terrific. So uh, we've talked so far about kind of safeguarding civilization, ensuring that we just make it through the next few centuries. Um, and that's been the kind of main focus of discussion when it comes to existential risk. Um, but we also, we don't want to merely make sure that we have a future at all. We also want to make sure that that future is as good as possible. We want to avoid horrific dystopian futures. We want to try and create a future that is positive and flourishing. And so trajectory change refers to uh, efforts that you can make to make the future better in those scenarios where the future lasts a long, we, civilization lasts a long time. And how can you do that? Well, a number of ways, but I think the most likely way is to influence the values that will guide the future, like the moral beliefs and norms, where, uh, you know, at the moment we are used to living through periods of great moral change. You know, the gay rights movement emerges in the 70s, and it's only a few decades that, um, you know, gay marriage is uh, legalized. And that's like, you know, rapid uh, moral change compared to history. Um, but that might change in the future. Um, this moral change that we, fast moral change that we know of, might end in the future. Because often uh, set moral worldviews or ideologies, they try to, in their nature, they often try to take power and they try to lock themselves in. So we saw this with uh, the rise of fascism with the Nazis during World War II. Hitler's Knight of the Long Knives gets into power, crushes the ideological competition. Similarly with Stalin's uh, Purges, gets into power, crushes the competition. Similarly with um, Pol Pot uh, and the Khmer Rouge. Because if you're an ideology and you want power, then you want to ensure that that ideological competition goes away. And my worry is that this could happen with the world as a whole, where, you know, in the 20th century, we already had two ideologies, um, fascism and uh, Stalinism, that really were aiming at global domination. Um, and I think, you know, luckily, we were not in a state where the world came close to that. Um, but it's not like that's a million miles away in terms of how history could have gone. And so then when I look to the next century, well, one major worry would be, for example, um, there's an outbreak of a third world war, uh, which I think is more likely than people would otherwise think. Uh, we're used to this long period of peace, but that really could change. I think it's something like one in three in our lifetimes. 
Uh, and the result of that could be single world government, single world ideology. And depending on what that ideology is like, could be very bad indeed. You know, something like what you got in 1984, with George Orwell with The Handmaid's Tale, mark that word. Um, and then finally, I think that with the development of new technology, and in particular AI, uh, that ideology could last, persist for a very long time indeed, potentially just as long as civilization does. So value lock-in isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as the values that are locked in are values that we would want over the long term. Uh, right. So if, you, if it were the case that the values that got locked in were the best ones, the, you know, the ones that we would all come to given sufficient reflection and 10,000 years to think and reason and empathize. Mach machine um, extrapolated volition has been utilized correctly and all of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, then, then that would be okay. However, we should appreciate that we today are very, very far away from having the right moral views. I mean, it would be this amazing coincidence if all of history, in through all of history, people had abominable moral views supporting slave owning or patriarchy or uh, atrocious views towards uh, criminals or people of different sexual orientations or people of other nations. Um, but we, in the early 21st century... Um, Nailed it. In West, Western countries. Nailed yeah, we've it. figured it all out. Um, be very surprising indeed. And so what we want to ensure is that we don't end moral progress kind of too soon. And if anyone kind of came to power in the world and were like, yes, I'm going to lock in my values now. I'm going to ensure that the things I want persist forever. I think that would be very bad. I think that would be a loss of almost all value we could achieve because we need to keep morally progressing into the future. That's what I was going to say. Is there an argument here to be made that optionality or whatever the word would be um or the, the regular change of a particular moral structure should be something which is optimized for that even if you were to potentially get rid of a moral structure that was more optimal and switch to one which is less optimal than that the fact that you've baked in the ability to switch helps you to mitigate some of the dangers of having complete lock-in for the rest of time overall that's exactly right. We want to have a world where um, we can change our moral views over time, and in particular, where we can change them over time um, in uh, light of good argument or you know empathy or just like moral considerations. And there might be many points of lock-in in the future. So the design of the first world government would be such a point of lock-in. Uh, first um space settlement as well like you can imagine there's a race dynamic and everyone's just trying to get out into space to claim those resources as fast as possible um i actually think that you know a couple of examples of lock-in in the past were uh the colonial era where you got this like single kind of worldview suddenly just spreading all over the world kind of western christian uh worldview um earlier times were the first world religions where again you've got this kind of bubbling of ideas then it compresses into, you know, the sanctified holy book and um, then persists for thousands of years. Or also actually just the rise of Homo sapiens as well. There used to be many Homo species. Uh, we used to have a diversity of human species. And then there were only one because one was a little bit more powerful and you want to, um, you know, predictably that it means that the competition um, is destroyed. What's your, problem with the happy, so, what's your problem with the happy birthday song? <laughs> um thank you for asking me about that that's not even in the in the book uh what we are the future does not discuss happy birthday so i use the example of happy birthday as an example of bad lock-in to illustrate the fact that uh even the fact that something becomes universal does not mean that it's necessarily like the right solution as it were like the best state of affairs so happy birthday is by far and away the most sung song in the world it's um, the song that's used to sit, to recognize someone's birthday um, in uh, at least many of the major languages. And it's terrible. It's like, it's pretty slow. So it's like a little bit like a dirge. Um, the emphasis is on the you, birthday to you. Like, oh, sorry. So the emphasis is uh, not on the you, which you expect. Um, it's on the two, which is like why on the preposition doesn't make sense. 
but then it also has like an octave leap, um, like happy birthday. It's like, and no one can sing it. So everyone's, because people are singing at different ranges. Um, so this is meant to be like a communal song, you know, your family gets together. So you want a song with like a really pretty small kind of melodic range, but instead it has this interval. And it means that like everyone just suddenly changes key at that point. And then like now, like half your family are singing in one key and half your family is singing in this other key. And it's just a cacophony. And there's no reason at all that it couldn't be much better. You can go on YouTube for people creating new versions of Happy Birthday that sound much better. Um, and why did that happen? Well, there didn't used to be a Happy Birthday song. In fact, the melody was for a different, it's called Good Morning to All, I think. Um, but um, in, uh, I think it was the early days of um, radio, gramophones and so on, um, I think perhaps like that was a mo what I call a moment of plasticity. So little moments in history when things could go one way, they could go another way, and we can really have an influence over um, what, di what direction happens. But then after that moment of plasticity, there's a kind of ossification. And so at that moment of plasticity, perhaps any of these songs could have like become the one that like gained the most popularity. But once Happy Birthday is the most popular song, um, once it's known that that's what you do to sing Happy Birthday, to recognize someone's birthday, well, then you're kind of locked in. It's very hard to switch from that. Because if I start singing some different melody, then everyone's like, what is this? And in the case of Happy Birthday, it's probably just, you know, we could uh, create, you know, there could be some government diktat that says, okay, we're all going to stop singing Happy Birthday because that doesn't make any sense. We're going to sing this different melody instead. And perhaps that would work. It's not a sufficiently important issue that I think that would happen. Um, some things like that have happened in the past. So uh, I think it was Sweden that used to drive on the left side of the road, but it's neighbors drove on the right. And so they had one day um, uh, where they just switched. They were like, okay, we're also going to drive on the road, right side of the road as well. I think it was 1978. And they had this huge kind of government campaign about it. They had like songs about it, um, the, a big song competition, the winner of which was called uh, Get to, Keep to the Right, Svensson. Um, and it was successful. They actually managed to switch from being locked in to driving on the left side of the road to driving on the right side of the road. In the case of Happy Birthday, I don't expect <coughs> that to happen. Um, but yeah, Happy Birthday illustrates how the fact that this song became so widely known um, does not at all, and culturally, that's almost culturally universal, does not at all suggest that it's the very best thing, um, that it's the best way we could have sung Happy Birthday. And I think Happy Birthday has an important lesson about future dystopia, which is that model norms and model memes, they can take over the entire world without necessarily being the best ones. And I think we're living at a moment of plasticity now um, with respect to what are the moral beliefs of our time that may not occur in the future. If we end up with this like single world culture, whether that's through conquest or just through the kind of merging of different ideas, and suddenly just everyone believes that X is right and Y is wrong, then what's the pressure to change from that? Um, I don't think there would be much pressure. And if those views are wrong, <laughs> If it's like the melody of Happy Birthday and not the melody of some better um, song, then that could be very bad. And that would be a bad thing that would persist for a very long time. What it shows mm. is the power of culture to be able to enforce norms. A lot of the time when you think about the future and potentially bad outcomes, you think about the 1984 dictatorial, bureaucratic, evil world government in tall buildings telling people that they're supposed to do something. But one of the most powerful enforcement mechanisms is social approval and disapproval and just grandfathered in expectations about what you're supposed to do. And what you have, one of the biggest problems you come up against is when the people that are in charge, the bureaucratic organization or the government or whatever, when they maybe even try to change something for the better and that runs counter to the flow that mm. you've got going through the culture, that's when you get uprisings and revolutions, sometimes kind of like idiotic ones. But the point is that culture is so important. We saw this, I use this example all the time. We saw this with the word woke. 
So think yeah. about the fact that woke was originally used uh, in rap songs. Then it kind of got weaponized, or utilized and adopted by people on the left that wanted to identify someone that was kind of socially aware and cared about social justice issues. And then very quickly, no one needed to mandate that woke was going to be the sort of thing that you didn't want to be associated with. But all of the comedians and satirists and people online managed to culturally enforce a norm where woke became such a toxic term that you didn't need to tell people not to use it. No one wanted to be associated with it because it was just such a, an uncool word. But well, what's cool? Why do, show me the, the cool mandate or the cool policy. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Simply enforced by norms. Yeah, I mean, there's just a huge amount of uh, what humans do is determined by yeah, these cultural attitudes, of just what's high status, what's cool, and what isn't. And you know, we can see this. So take conspicuous consumption, the fact that uh, people like to show off how rich they are. And that can be, you know, across many different cultures that is used um, as a way to show like, um, you know, how successful you've been. There are different ways of doing that that are cool in different, circ in different societies over time. So it could be buying fast cars, having expensive watches, or if we go into the past, um, having very nice fabrics or uh, things like that. It could be owning slaves. So in the Roman Empire, um, the more sl slaves were the status symbol. Some Roman senators had thousands of slaves. Um, it could be philanthropy. So this is at least through to some extent in the United States that engaging in philanthropic activity is a way of demonstrating conspicuous of conspicuous consumption. And which of these do we have? I think it's largely a cultural issue, um, very largely a cultural issue. And that really matters because whether the demonstration of conspicuous consumption, which is, I think, you know, just very human, again, a human universal, whether that's done in a particular culture through philanthropy, through buying fast cars or through um, slave owning makes a very big difference to the well-being of the world. And I certainly know, um, I certainly know which I prefer. And I think, yeah, social scientists are only really starting to appreciate the importance of culture in the last few decades. It's the sort of thing that hasn't gotten enough attention because, well, it's kind of ephemeral. Um, it's like you can't quantify it or measure it as, um, as much as perhaps other things like laws or economics. economic matters. Exactly. But over the course of writing this book, just more and more I got convinced that culture is an enormous force. It's almost it's generally culture that influences um, political change rather than the other way around. If you get a political change without cultural change, then um, that often doesn't go well. And in the book, in What We Are the Future, I focus in particular on the abolition of slavery, which when I was kind of, you know, before writing this book, I would have thought is just clearly kind of an econ economic matter, uh, something that was kind of inevitable as um, our technology improved, slavery was just no longer um, kind of viable means of production. But I think I was wrong, actually. I think that the primary driver of the abolition of slavery throughout the world was a cultural change. And that was actually based on people considering moral arguments and making changes on the basis of moral arguments. <coughs> um, and I think in the future, we could have, uh, you know, equally large changes that could or not could or not occur based on what moral arguments are present. I've got a fix for the happy birthday problem, by the way, uh, which is hit me. So uh, we can't. I, I'm not strong enough in my mental capacities to change the actual tune, but you can safeguard yourself from not being able to do the octave by starting the song one key lower than you think that you need to. Everybody should do mm. this. Everybody starts belting out happy birthday pretty close to the upper yeah. bound of where they can go in terms of melody mm -hmm. no 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 no. bring it back mm -hmm. give yourself some headroom that's what you need yeah. and then when it comes okay. to that when it comes to that Everything key change you can nail it yeah yeah exactly exactly you've got this sort of beautiful okay, warm well, sound you heard it here first life hacks for yeah, everyone if there's, it. <laughs> if there's one thing that you take from this podcast <laughs> forget forget about the future generations Sing happy birthday in a baritone. <laughs> happy birthday. That's you. That dude, I'm, I'm telling you, that's it. So, okay, well, there we go. You've proved my life. Thank you. Um, I think 
it's really interesting to think about what what cultures and, and and stuff lock in over a longer term. But presumably, this means that we need to safeguard civilization from a bunch of suboptimal futures. And you've got three different ones: extinction, uh, you've got global civilizational collapse, and you've got stagnation. So, starting with uh, extinction, what's the like? Do you th- are we going to go extinct? Like, what's 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 going to happen? Yeah, I think probably not. Um, uh, so in general, you know, it's hard to kill everybody, thankfully. <laughs> um, uh, there are 8 billion people in a very diverse array of environments with diverse societies. Um, and thankfully, there are very few people in the world that really want to kill everyone. Um, so the scenarios where that happens, I think um, something's gone really pretty badly wrong. But it's not zero at all. So. Um, if we just con- consider pandemics, what's the risk of uh, an engineered pandemic? That is a pandemic that's not from natural causes, but that is the result of design in a lab where we already have technology to improve the destructive power of the viruses now. And that's just getting better and better every year. And so, you know, it's not very long that it will be quite widely accessible that we'll have the power to create viruses that could kill hundreds of millions, billions of people, maybe even more. What extinction risk would I put at that? Maybe something like 0.5% um, this century, um, and much higher that there will be some engineered pandemic that would kill uh, very large numbers of people. Maybe that's like 20% or of, of something in a, um, by the end of the century. Uh, and that's just far too high, <laughs> um, like far, far too high. Uh, because there are things we can do. So I mentioned far UVC lighting. There's also early detection. So we could just be monitoring wastewater all around the world, scanning it for um, DNA, uh, ignoring human DNA, and seeing, is there anything new in here? Is there something we should be worried about? And if so, then we can act um, kind of immediately. There's also just more advanced personal protective equipment. So masks that have just you know, super protective, not just like, you know, the cloth masks you get, but full head things that would ensure that if you were a key worker, you would be guaranteed to avoid infection. That's something we could be working on now as well. So yeah, this is a just how we respond to this is contingent. It's kind of, it's up to us. Um, we can choose to get that risk kind of, yeah, way down to zero where it ought to be. What's your opinion on Nick Bostrom's vulnerable world hypothesis? Uh, so it is a hypothesis. So to explain, the hypothesis is that there could be some technology in our future that gives the power to destroy the world to basically everyone in the world. Um, and if so, then it would seem like it would be very likely that the world would end pretty soon. And he gives the analogy of imagine if it was as easy to create, let's say, a doomsday virus as it is to just put sand in a microwave. Um, Then it just seems like we wouldn't last very long because there's just so many actors, each making their own independent choices, that uh, we would just, um, someone at some point would do so. Uh, I think it's very unlikely, to be honest, that the future looks like that. Um, The main reason that is that... um, we just ban technology all the time. Um, so there are many technologies that we don't like. So take human cloning or something. We could clone humans now if we wanted to. And we choose not to um, on ethical grounds because it's um, taboo. And that's kind of globally enforced. Um, in his essay um, on the vulnerable world hypothesis, Nick kind of thinks, Nick, you know, if we were in this vulnerable world, would that mean that the only solution would be um, some very powerful surveillance state? Uh, I think, I think, like, no. Obviously, that would be like a really bad outcome too. Um, and what we can do instead is just like have strong international norms about um, what technologies we do allow to develop and which we don't. Where um, yeah, one is that humanity is at least somewhat 
good at kind of recognizing risks and taking action on the basis of them. And actually, in general, being quite cautious with respect to new technology. And then secondly, technology is often used for defensive measures as well as offensive. And so in general, um, uh, you know, in general, I think the a vulnerable world hypothesis, it's, it's possible that that will occur in the future. Um, but uh, I think I'm a little more optimistic than perhaps Nick might be. Given the uh, risk or potential future of an extreme surveillance state, which would be one potential solution to try and constrain the degrees of freedom mm. that people can do fuckery with whatever it is that, yep. that they've got, um, can you see a potential human future where an effective long-termist civilization is basically incompatible with democracy? I mean, you could. So in What We Are the Future, I talk a lot about, this is why the kind of considering both values side of things and like risk side of things is so important because, you know, if you're only focused on the, on the extinction side of the spectrum, then you might think, okay, we need some undemocratic civilization that can monitor the, everyone's behavior so that no one can pose a risk to the future of uh, civilization. And to be clear, Nick Boston and Toby Orr, they don't believe this, but this is a kind of a straw man view that you could come away with. But then you've got this authoritarian state that I think has lost most of the value that we could have had. Um, it's not just about making sure that the future is long. It's also about making sure that it's good. Um, and so, you know, is the ideal governance of the distant future democracy? I don't know. Maybe we can do something much better. <laughs> um, democracy would have been unheard of, uh, you know, for most of most cultures um, throughout history. Uh, you know, perhaps there's something we haven't even thought of that on reflection uh, we would think is an even better mode of governance. Um, but I think I'd be very worried about something that's more authoritarian, precisely for the reason that I think we could easily lose um, most value in the course um, as a result of that. Where, you know, the great and actually quite fragile thing about liberal democracy that we have um, in places like the US and the UK is just that you've got a great vibrancy of debate and discussion and therefore are able to kind of drive forward moral progress. People are able to like have moral campaigns. People are able to criticize the views of people that are in power. And when you think, reflect on kind of human psychology, that's like a surprising thing. <laughs> um, and the fact that it's actually quite rare in history should make you appreciate that um, it's really something I think should be uh, treasured and, tried to, and we should try and protect. Um, and so, yeah, anything that's like, oh, we need like strong, really strong kind of government in order to reduce risks of extinction even further. And I'm, I'm generally like, look, can we get 90% of the risk reduction by other means? And I think that often you can. If you're concerned about extinction, presumably more people on the planet would spread the risk more, would make complete extinction more difficult because the virus or the AI or the asteroid or the supervolcano or whatever simply has got more work to do. And for every human that you add, there is a potential chance that they may survive and there may be a few of them and then maybe they could repopulate. What's your view on whether or not the world has too many or too few people in it? Uh, it's a great question. Um, and there are considerations on either side of the ledger. So it's a very common kind of idea that there are too many people, resource depletion and climate change, and you shouldn't have kids because they will contribute to climate change. Um, but I think those are, and, you know, they're the, it's true. I contribute to climate change um, uh, through my life. Uh, if I were to have kids, they would as well. Um, but that's only looking at one aspect of human, of what people do, because people do good things too, and they innovate and they, uh, you know, affect moral change. Um, they contribute to infrastructure, pay taxes that benefit all of society. Um, I'd also say they just, if they have, if someone has a sufficiently good life, that's just a, living is good for them as well. And that's the sort of moral consideration we should take into account. Um, but then, yeah, you're right, actually having more people. Um, I mean, so actually, yeah, so I'll go back a step for those reasons. I actually think that on balance, um, we should have more people rather than fewer. Um, the benefits from an additional person, in particular via both technological and moral innovation, 
um, as well as the benefits to them, kind of outweigh uh, the negative effects, especially given that you can you can counteract those negative effects. So if you're having a child, you can offset the, their carbon emissions. And actually, you can do so for you know a few hundred dollars a year. It's a very small fraction of the cost to have a child. Um, but then how does having kids putting aside climate change, how does having more people in the world impact extinction risk? It's interesting. Lots of considerations on either side. So you're totally right that it spreads the risk. We've got more people in more diverse environments, and that makes us safer. Um, and it's actually un, a little unclear to me whether, like in the world today, this year, uh, is extinction risk higher or lower than it was a thousand years ago. Now, a thousand years ago, we couldn't have, um, uh, you know, couldn't have blown ourselves up with nuclear weapons. But the extinction risk from nuclear, you know, at least with current arsenal sizes, not with kind of future, potentially much larger arsenal sizes, um, extinction risk is pretty hard. And that's partly because there's just, is, it, extinction is really pretty unlikely, I think. And that's partly because there are just so many people in the world today. And we have like, great, you know, we have technology that can protect ourselves. Whereas a thousand years ago, well, there was, you know, there was a risk of asteroid strikes. And it's not clear that the world would have been able to come back from that. Um, however, I think that most of the extinction risks we face, you know, having a difference between 8 billion people and 10 billion people, it's going to be pretty small. Like we already have it, basically all the inhabitable areas of Earth. And that's the much bigger consideration compared to sheer population size. Um, the biggest consideration, I think, is this is relates to stagnation, where it's, well, you know, it's relatively plausible to me that technological progress will slow down over the, um, over the coming century and centuries to come. Um, basically, if we don't, if AI doesn't speed it up, then I think there's a good chance it slows down. And that's because we're just not able to add more and more researchers to work on R&D. So, you know, further technological progress is just harder and harder and harder the more we do of it. Um, but we, in the past, we've solved that by just adding more and more people doing R&D and like trying to do technological innovation. Um, that's by both just having a larger population. So we have 8 billion people alive today. Um, it was, I think, 200 years ago, we had a billion people. Um, but also increasing the proportion of people devoted to R&D. And we know that population is going to like peak, maybe by about 2050, and then afterwards decline, um, maybe as late as 2100. We're not, we don't really know. And we just there's only so far you can go by increasing the um proportion of the world of your population devoted to r&d and that does suggest and if we stagnate a period a very risky period when let's say we have very advanced bioweapons but not the technology to def defend against them i think that would be a bad thing from the perspective of civilization it would increase the risk of us going extinct and in that respect having you know there being more people would be helpful. It would give us a longer lead time. It would, you know, help further technological progress. Um, okay, I've spoken for quite a long time, but that being said, I don't think this is like a huge issue either way. Can you dig in a little bit more to the risk of technological stagnation? You know, why is it that there's kind of an embedded growth obligation within technological progress? Uh, yeah, so that was uh, pretty quick. So many people who think about the long term, who th focus on the future, are often pretty bullish on economic growth. And the argument for this is like, oh, well, it compounds over time. Um, you know, if you're uh, getting, you know, even just increasing a growth rate by like 1% over 70 years means you've kind of made people on 70 years twice as rich as they otherwise would be. It's this huge difference and it compounds over time. Um, that's actually not a reason why I am concerned about technological stagnation. Because, uh, you know, as I suggested earlier, I just don't think you can have economic growth that compounds for very long periods of time. That's you get to the situation where 
you've got 10 to the power 89 civilizations for worth of output. And it's just, this just doesn't seem plausible. So instead, at some point, we're going to just plateau. And that means that if you speed up economic growth now, well, then you get to the plateau a little bit earlier. And that's kind of good into the intervening years, but not good over the long term. Or like makes no difference over the long term. So one way of putting this is that I think that in general, tech progress is kind of kind of inevitable. It like probably will keep happening. Maybe just a faster or slower rate. However, stagnation would be very different. And that's where it's not just that growth slows, but we just stop growing altogether. Um, or even the economy starts to shrink. Uh, where we're just like not inventing new things that are improving people's quality of life. And that I think could be quite bad um, if we're at this period of high extinction risk. So to, as an intuition pump, suppose that technology had completely stagnated in the 1920s. So we reached the 1920s and then after that, there's no more innovation ever. Would that have been good? Would that have been sustainable? And the answer is no, I think. Um, if we'd stayed at 1920s level of, tech, of uh, technology, the only way we could have supported civilization is by burning fossil fuels and burning them indefinitely until we burned all of them. Um, that would have obviously caused like extreme levels of climate change and an absolute catastrophe. And also then we would start to regress because we just could no longer, we would run, have run out of fossil fuels and um, we would no longer be able to power civilization. It was only by further technological development that gave us clean sources of energy like nuclear power um, and solar panels. And I think we could enter similar unsustainable states in the near future, where again, bioweapons are the main one, where imagine, okay, now we're at 2050 levels of technology. We have advanced bioweapons, the sorts of things that in principle could kill everyone on the planet, but not the technology to defend against them. And now imagine we're at that level of technology for a thousand years. I really don't rate our chances in that world. Um, the risk, even if it was low, even if it was just 1% per century, well, over a thousand years, okay, 10,000 years, you know, the risk will add up and over the long run, we're almost certainly doomed. So we need that, that consideration suggests that we need to, at least in a measured way, kind of navigate our way through the time of pedals, the time of heightened um, existential risk, so that we can get out the other side and be te sufficiently technologically advanced that uh, we aren't facing risks of catastrophe just every year that add up over time and instead have a position of, yeah, what my colleague Toby Ord calls existential security, where actually we've gotten risk to a very low level indeed. Yeah, you want to get to sort of X risk mastery in one form or another. One of the things that I always thought about when I considered long-termism, especially after Toby's book, was, well, why, why aren't the smart people in X-Risk campaigning for unbelievably slow technological development? Uh, let's say that the urn ball analogy works and that there's dangers with every new technology that you develop. Why not take 10,000 years to add in another line of computer code right, to the, to the AI that we're doing. Like, why not? You know, if, if what we've said is true and that there's this basically limitless, endless duration for the potential of humanity and, yeah, we need to get off Earth within 2 billion years or whatever or the oceans are going to boil, but we've got time. Why not yeah. mandate or somehow enforce a, an insane slowing of technology? But it sounds like one of the reasons that you can't do that is because you need to be able to continue the conveyor belt of technological progress in order to protect ourselves from some of the negative externalities of previous technologies that we've already <laughs> locked in their existence of. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you make it sound like this, like that race conveyor belt. Well, or something, is that is that not kind of how it is? Uh, like, well, well, we've already started. I mean, we now have you know uh, close to ten thousand nuclear warheads ready to launch. We're running that risk every single year. Um, and so hopefully there's a state in the future that does not have such high risks. Um, and then we can just like stay in that state of technological advancement. I should say that, yeah, I'm pro tech growth. Not everyone who endorses long termism is by any means. Um, other people actually would want technological progress to go more slowly 
and more sustainably. Uh, one thing we all agree is we want certain technologies to be slowed and others to move faster. What would be so some defensive- examples of those? Well, uh, again, the, things are often easiest. We haven't talked much about AI, but things are often easiest to talk about in the biorisk case, where this far UVC lighting that, if if it works, like safely satellites a room, that's a defensive technology. Let's have that as fast as possible. Technology that allows you to redesign viruses um, to make them more deadly. Let's just delay that. How, how about we do that in the future and uh, not just now? Um, so, and that's an idea that Nick Boston calls differential technological progress. So basically we all endorse, I think almost everyone would endorse that paradigm. But then if we're talking about tech or economic growth as a whole, should we go faster? Should we go slower? Um, I lean on the faster side. Other people would lean on the slower side. Um, some people think that with AI in particular, we should really just be trying to slow that down enormously if we could. Um, perhaps even just say, like, look, there are certain sorts of AI technology that uh, we shouldn't allow, like human cloning, like in the same way that globally we don't allow human cloning. But the main thing is just, you know, when we're taking action, we need to consider the tractability of what we're trying to do. And I think it's extremely hard to slow down tech progress or economic growth as a whole for the world as a whole. So let's say, you know, I'm a, I become an activist, I dedicate my life to doing this, and I convince the UK to stop growing. Doesn't make a difference in the long term, because all the other countries in the world are going to keep growing. Okay, let's say I managed, I'm superhero activist, managed to convince, um, you know, 109, I've actually forgotten how many countries there are in the world, but I convince every country but one to keep, um, to just stop growing. Well, the last country keeps growing. Before long, it's just become the entire world economy. Um, Because if you've got compound growth, even if you're the small country growing at 2% per year, when all of the other countries are stagnant, um, within a couple of hundred years, then you will be the world economy. And and the activism of those other, all those other countries um, will have been absolutely for naught. Yeah, this is... And that's how I feel about the kind of degrowth movement in general, which comes from a very different... um, perspective kind of environmentalism is whether or not it's a good idea um and i you know i tend to think that the sentiment is not great but whether or not it's a good idea it's also just ultimately futile because it would need to be a global effort and i think given the you know given the just next level of difficulty we're talking about in trying to do that there are just better things we could be doing such as accelerating the good tech delaying the bad tech it's a combination of a lack of a god's eye perspective and ability to deploy stuff with some sort of malthusian trap and a tragedy of the commons for the future it's like all of that kind of mixed up together to create this sort of terrible terrible potential yeah exactly and in general you know one thing i really always want to clarify with long-termism and work on existential risk and the stuff that what we do with effective altruism in general, and also what I'm talking about and what we are the future, is that I'm pr- proposing action on the margin. So it's like, take the world as it is, have a perspective on the world as a whole. And how are resources being allocated? Should we change, like, in what way are they misallocated? Should we change them a bit? So when I'm advocating for long-termism, I'm not saying all resources should go to positively impacting the long-term. What I am saying is that at the moment, um, you know, 0.01% of the world's resources are uh, focused on representing and trying to defend the interests of future generations. And maybe it should be higher than that. Maybe 0.1%. That would be nice. Maybe even as high as 1%. And so similarly, if we're thinking, oh, how fast should the world grow or not? In order for that, for the action relevant question is like, what should I do? Should I try and speed it up or slow it down on the margin? That's the action relevant question, not this, oh, what, you know, if I could control the actions of everyone in the world, what should I do? Because I don't, I don't, all we can ever do is make this little difference on the margin. What do you think about the volume of attention that's being paid to climate change? Uh, over my overall view is 
enormously positive about it. So, you know, when you look at uh, different model traditions over time, it's actually the markably of a concern for the future is like remarkably of it. Um, surprisingly, like, you know, for the book, I was really, I went to be like, oh, I want to find, you know, Christian thinkers talking about the distant future, at, like what we owe future generations and uh, Hindu thinkers and Buddhist thinkers and Confucians. Um, and it, you know, it, it's not like I did the deepest dive, but it was kind of surprisingly hard. Um, there are actually more thought in kind of um, indigenous um, philosophy, such as the Iroquois. Um, but yeah, then, but certainly kind of secular um, post-enlightenment thought, it's like surprisingly there. And then over the course of the you know 20th century and then certainly the last few decades, we've had this enormous upsurge from the environmentalist um, uh, movement that really is standing up for future generations. And they've seen kind of one part of this, which is focus on you know stewarding resources, especially irrevocable losses like species loss and a particular problem of climate change. And I really feel like, oh, wow, this is just this amazing and like, again, kind of contingent thing that there, is been, there has been this groundswell of concern for um, how the, our actions could be impacting, yeah, not just the present day, but also um, the world we leave for our kids and our grandkids. And then the thing I just want to say on top of that is like, okay, yeah, this is this great model insight. Um, and that model insight makes you concerned about climate change. Here are a bunch of other things you should be concerned about well, dude, too. That's, I mean, that really is the main takeaway from reading Toby's book. And he's got that uh, table of the uh, chance within the next century of something happening and a, a supernova explosion is one in a hundred billion or something like that. And yeah, a super yeah. volcano is one in 10 billion or something. And you start to move your way down and you get toward climate change, which I think is either one in 10,000 or one in 1,000 over the next hundred years. And then you get to engineered pandemics and unknown unknowns and AI safety. And it's one in 10. And I think the overall risk is maybe one in six. Uh, so when I read that, it it did it does make me, I, I understand your point, right? That anything that encourages people to think about the future generally of the planet and of humanity is smart. But I worry that there is a little bit of a, a value lock-in that's going on here where anything that detracts away from a focus on climate change is seen as almost like heresy and mm -hmm. that all of our future existential risk conversations have been completely captured by a conversation about climate change. Dude, five or seven years ago, the only people talking about AI safety were getting laughed out of a room. Like conferences. Ut ut utterly fringe. I mean, I was there. I was like the early drafts of Nick Boston's super intelligence. I was part of these seminar rooms. And I was like this young guy trying to figure out um, what it's, you know, what should I be into or buy? And I was like, this is, I mean, I was into, I was curious in it and I was helping and I, we were having conversations. But it was also, it felt very, very fringe. Laughed out of the room. And like. now it's kind of, yeah, now it's much more mainstream. That That's my concern. And uh, that was that was the takeaway from Toby's book. and And also... One of the reasons why I think that I know that you guys do testing on messaging and stuff, and I really, really think that that's one of the most important areas. Look at me bro sciencing my way into stuff that you guys deconstruct very, very fine tuned on a daily basis. For me, I, I'm so compelled by the ideas that came from Nick's work and Toby's work yeah. and your stuff and Anders and, you know, like pick your favorite existential risk philosopher. Yeah. And it blows my mind that that hasn't made even a fragment of the impact of a Swedish girl shouting at <laughs> adults on a stage. And it, it, I find myself being less drawn and almost triggered sometimes by the uh, environmental movement because of how much attention is paid to it and how little attention is paid to other X risks that I think should take priority. Uh, for sure. So a general thought of just if someone's saying, my cause is X and it's the only thing that matters and everything should be determined in terms of my, like how it impacts my cause. That's just like social media does not help with this. Um, but, uh, yeah, that is just like systematically, um, not a good way of thinking. 
and it ha- and it happens. One thing uh, that writing the but like what we are the future has made me appreciate is just that like chain model change takes time. So if we look at climate change, so okay, now it has, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I see, I listen, I hear climate change and I feel kind of inspired by it when I'm like, okay, cool. Give us a few decades and we're going to be, maybe we're going to be there where concern about the climate, you know, it actually goes back a really long way. So the first quantitative estimate of the, Im- the impact of emitting CO2 goes back to a um, climatologist called Svent Arrhenius in 1896. And his estimate was actually pretty good. Um, it was like a little bit on the, a little on the high side. And then the term, the greenhouse, I guess, greenhouse effect was early 20th century. Frank, Frank Capra, Capra um, the director of It's a Wonderful Life, had a documentary about climate change in the 1950s. Um, so the level of concern was there, and then you know scientific consensus was the 60s and 70s. Then it's like the 90s, not really noughties, but like the um, activism around climate change starts to really happen and build up. And so when I think about AI and bio risk and so on, I'm kind of like it's like we're in the 1950s with climate change. Okay. And uh, there's actually a leading, and so I'm just like. Yeah, there's certain like scientific technological facts um, that are just enormously important. People don't know them yet. We've got to build this movement. This is going to take time. It's frustrating that, uh, you know, I completely understand being frustrated. That's like, this is so big and people aren't thinking about it. Um, uh, but I guess like I respond by that by being like, okay, let's go. Let's so they've wet. Let's, are you, are yeah. you kind of saying that climate change and the activism around that is a appetizer? It's an aperitif to <laughs> exactly. us coming in. Well, dude. Me, yeah, exactly. I I very much admire your uh, positive, uh, optimistic outlook around it, and that that does fill me with a little bit more hope. The fact that look, people needed to understand about the fragility of human future. One of the ways that this got delivered, because it's very obvious, you know, smoke in the sky and fires and heat and stuff, right? It's like, it's experiential, uh, as opposed to AI risk, which is just code you can't see until it's not. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, maybe 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 you're right. Maybe maybe that's a, a thing. Uh, going, going back to what we spoke about before. So you've got extinction, but you've also got unrecoverable global collapse, What's the difference yeah. between those two things and how would a global collapse happen? Okay, so um, I said extinction seems pretty hard. I mean, I still give it 0.5%. That's a lot. When you're talking about, you know... That's only 0.5 over yeah. the next 100 years. It was 20% that's for over the rest the next of the... Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, no, 20% was the risk of some major, like hundreds of millions of dead okay. kind of okay. level okay. pandemic. Got you. Um, yeah, I mean, terror, like... Well, Still not good. Decide whether to trust me or not, but utterly terrifying, I think. Um, yeah, so I mentioned like killing literally everyone. Um, okay, that's like, uh, you know, maybe that's, you know, low, you know, low, but very, very significant likelihood. Um, a catastrophe that just set us back to pre industrial levels of technology. So killed 99% or 99.9% of the world's population. At least you might think that might be much more likely. And could occur from a variety, like could also occur from pandemics, um, could occur from an all-out nuclear war that leads to nuclear winter, um, you know, perhaps could occur via other means. Um, would we get would we come back? Because if if not, then the unrecovered collapse of civilization would plausibly be just as bad or almost as bad as outright extinction. You know, we would go to like a farming society again, or even hunter gatherer society limp along an asteroid would, you know, uh, cause it and you know, wipe us out. Um, over, it would just be a matter of time essentially. And so I, you know, there hadn't been that much work, um, before, before what we owe the future on this question of 
how likely is a civilizational collapse? If there was one, like, would we actually come back? And so I really wanted to do a, a deep dive into this and really try to think that, yeah, assess the question of like, well, yeah, would we come back? And if not, why not? And I actually kind of came out pretty optimistic, um, certainly over the course of doing the search uh, for what we are the future. I came out being a lot more positive, thinking it's like well over 90 percent, I think, that civilization would bounce back if we move back to the industrial levels of technology. Um, and that's for a few reasons. So one is that uh, if you look at local catastrophes, they very rarely le lead to collapse. Um, I'm actually not sure if I even know any examples um, of collapse in the relevant sense where you take the fall of the Roman Empire, that was a collapse of a civilization. But firstly, it was only local. There's never been a kind of global collapse of civilization. And secondly, it's not like people disappeared from the region. It's just that like technology went backwards for a while and um, you know other indicators of advanced civilization kind of went back for a while. Whereas if you know we would be thinking about that happening on a global scale and going to kind of pre-industrial levels. And so even if you take something like the Black Death um, in Europe, which killed somewhere between like 25% and 60% of the population of Europe, there wasn't a civilizational collapse. It was a, like enormously tragic um, with such a loss of life. But civilization kind of, European civilization kept going. And in fact, there was the Industrial Revolution just a, f a few centuries later. Um, and yeah, in the book, I discuss many other ways in which locally um, so societies have like taken these enormous knocks and then kind of bounced back. So I give the example of Hiroshima as well, where again, prior to the search, I'd had this image in my mind of Hiroshima, even now as just this like smoking ruin, whereas it's not true at all. Within 13 years, the population was back to um, the population before it was um, uh, had an atomic bomb dropped on it. Um, now it's this like flourishing city. So that's kind of one reason. A second is just how much uh, technology um, that could be imitated or information in libraries that people could use in order to like, you know, make technological advancement again, where, you know, the early innovators, they were doing this from scratch. There was nothing to copy. Whereas if you're like, oh, there's this thing, it seems to like burn oil in order to like make a motor go around. Like I want, like maybe we can copy this. It becomes like much easier, especially then there's materials in libraries too. And then the final consideration is just that um, uh, it, if you think, if you try and just go through a list of like, what are the things that could stop us from getting to today's level of technology again, you kind of come up short. I think the one that could could be decisive is fossil fuels, um, where we've already kind of used up easily accessible oil. And over the course of a few hundred years, we would use up easily accessible coal. Um, but at least for the time being, uh, we have enough in the way of fossil fuels that even a catastrophe that sent us back to, even that sent us back to the Stone Age, we would come, we would come back. And if we were industrializing again, we'd be, we'd have enough to get to today's level of technology at least. What's your idea about coal mines and what we should do with them? <laughs> yeah. So, um, in, in the book, I talk about, uh, kind of clean tech in particular as this like just very robustly good thing we can do. Um, but the reasons for that aren't always the most intuitive. <laughs> so one, you know, there are many reasons, I think, for wanting to keep coal in the ground. Climate change is one, enormous health pollution, the air pollution and health costs from burning fossil fuels. Um, but one is just we might need it in the future. Um, if there's a catastrophe that sends civilization back to agricultural or pre-agricultural levels of technology, and we need to reindustrialize, well, we got to where we are by burning prodigious amounts of coal. Um, and we might need that again. Uh, and yet we're burning through it. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I think the best thing to do is just invest in clean tech. So um, that's not just solar panels, but also alternative fuels. Uh, what's called super hot rock geothermal, where you drill just really far into the ground and um, harness the heat from 
uh, closer to the mantle. Um, but one idea that I looked into is just, can you just buy coal mines and shut them down? Um, that was the kind of like no brain like <laughs> take. Um, and like, could you do this at scale? Could you do this as a way of carbon offsetting where a large group of people get together, they all contribute to a fund that like pays for the coal mine to be retired. Um, there are people looking into this um, uh, and I commissioned some of the search to look into it. It seems pretty hard, unfortunately, mainly for regulatory reasons um, where uh, governments have, I mean, there are just very powerful fossil fuel lobbies and they don't like you buying coal mines and shutting them down. So there's kind of use it or lose it laws where um, uh, if you try and buy a coal mine with the purpose of shutting it down, the government just voids your contract because they say if you buy a coal mine, you have to use the coal. Um, and that I think, you know, even if you can get around that, that drives up the price a lot more. Um, people perhaps just shift to other coal. So unfortunately, I'm like a little more negative on that particular strategy than I used to be. But for a while, I was just really taken with it. I just, I just really loved this idea of just like, we own this coal mine now. We're going to turn it into this museum, um, museum for obsolete technology. And it'll have like, you can go around like a theme park um, in the like, uh, the little trucks that you see in Indiana Jones, like going along the carts. <laughs> Um, I had the whole vision, but uh, maybe one day I'll still do it. Well, but we've it got might not be the most impactful thing. We've got those seed banks, right? There's is it in Iceland, I think, or in and Svalbard. That's it um, in Norway, and yeah. that's a bunch of every plant seed on the planet. And presumably, there must be equivalent backups digitally of every book, probably distributed across the world, and they'll be in underground bunkers or on the side of a mountain or something like that so that if there was some sort of huge collapse or a, any kind of existential risk that had a bit of kinetic energy to it that it would be it would be kept away and what that does is it it shortcuts the um pain and the investment that you need in order to be able to actually find out what to do you can just go back and read what you need to yeah. do and then you get to rediscover the technologies and I, i've never heard anyone else talk about it the fact that one of the advantages we had was that all of the coal and the oil was relatively close to the surface. And you mm. pick the, by design, you pick the low hanging fruit first, but that doesn't future proof you against uh, re collapse recoveries potentially well, because if you do collapse and you need to recover, presumably you're going to be able to get low hanging fruit, but not the less, the higher hanging fruit yeah. so easily, which means that you actually need to keep that. You need to portion off a little bit in future i was thinking yeah. about this as well so, is, is there a reason or would there be a justification for having a an almost like an air gapped civilization somewhere on earth i know that we don't we're not a multi-planetary mm -hmm. species yet so we haven't put somebody on mars and maybe that would be a, one of the obvious ways to do this but to have a selection of people with a wide genetic pool and you've done the testing on them and they go to a particular place and they are they live there for their entire lives, or perhaps you could do it like military service, and people could cycle in and out, and you would maybe go for four years. But what that that's kind of like as close to air gapping a backup for civilization behind the normal civilization that we've got going on, in the same way as the seed bank, or the same way as the modern library of Alexandria, or whatever we've got. Is there a just yep. is there a justification for us sending some people into the side of a mountain and making them live there for ages? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um... On your previous point, I just wanted to briefly mention that the idea of harnessing the low-hanging fruit, you know, there's this historical counterfactual where if we were to go, if we were to collapse, where would the industrial revolution happen? And I can bet you my last dollar it would not happen in Western Europe um, because we already used up all the surface coal. Instead, it would be in the US or India or China or Australia where there's, where there's more. Um, but okay, civilizational backup. Um, this is not only, I think, a good idea. Um, it's something that people who buy into the idea of long-termism, I think we really might make happen. So again, with foundations I advise, it's, um, and philanthropists I advise, uh, this is something we'd be pretty interested in doing. Um, uh, so having a hermetically sealed um, refuge where a certain number of people um, stay in that for long periods of time, um, yeah, perhaps it's six months at a time and kind of cycles out. Perhaps it's like a stage. Um, there's a couple of them and you do it asynchronously. 
um, or perhaps it's even longer, um, that is completely protected against the outside world. So again, if there's a really worst case pandemic, then, and it's, you know, we're not just talking about um, hundreds of millions of people dying here, but literally it will kill everyone. Well, you have this population of, let's say, a thousand people, including leading scientists who would be able to work on, um, you know, medical countermeasures um, like vaccines. And they would then be able to stay there and you'd equip it such that they could stay there for years, um, design countermeasures so that when they emerge, um, if they need to, um, they are protected against the pathogens. Uh, and then the second thing, you would also need to stock it such that it could um, rebuild society after that point. Um, this seems just like so wacky as an idea to many people, um, but I think it makes sense. Like um, on the scale of the whole of the world, you know, we have a world GDP of close to a hundred trillion dollars. We have 8 billion people. Does it make sense to spend at least a little bit of those resources? Um, like, you know, a few hundred or a thousand people to be just like protected in case for the like fairly worst case outcomes. I think from that perspective, the answer seems like, yeah, ov obviously yes, because yeah, even if it was a small population, a few hundred people, that would be enough. Uh, to the you know, to the build civilization again, and I think it's worth preserving. Rob Reed laughed at me when I gave him that idea <laughs> last year. So this is yeah, I did. I like it. I think it's a, but, I think it's a cool idea. But I think um, it's interesting the response that you know, and I have it too. When you get confronted with certain ideas that just sound like the sci-fi or something, and you laugh at them, but that's just been true for many ideas in the past, like. Um, the idea that uh, viruses were carried by these little monsters that live in your hands and crawl in your skin. It's like, what? This is nonsense. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, the idea that we could fly, um, you know, build big metal planes and take them into the skies. Like, that was pretty, that was pretty wacky, too. So I think we have this, like, you know, very natural human impulse to just laugh at these, like, silly ideas. But I think when the stakes are this great, we should actually just be taking a little bit of time to th reflect and think, okay, does this actually make good sense? And I think in this case it does. Given everything that we've gone through and the potential duration that we're moving towards for our genetic inheritance and civilizational future, the risks that we've got, the way that we can mitigate them, how we can move back against them, what's the actual goal? What, what should our goal for the future of humanity B, what are we what are we even optimizing for? What are we building for? So I think the key thing I want to say is that we don't know yet, and that's okay. So imagine you're a teenager and you're wondering, like, oh, what's the goal of my life? And you just want to be as happy as possible, let's say. Now you might just not, not know yet. You know, and what do you want to do? Well, okay, as a teenager, you want to not die, because if you die, then you're gonna <laughs> um uh, you know you're not going to have a flourishing life after that point. Um, so similarly, we want to make sure we don't go extinct. But then you just want to have lots of possible futures open to you and be able to have time to like figure stuff out, try things out, see what's actually is going to make um, give you the most flourishing life. And that's okay. So you can have a plan that is about getting yourself to a position such that you can figure out what to do for the rest of your life. And I think the same is true for humanity as a whole. We want to, we should try to get ourselves to a state where we are not facing existential catastrophe. We are, we do have many possible futures open to us. We're able to reflect and deliberate um, and then make further moral progress so that we can then collectively figure out from a place of kind of much more enlightened, much more enlightened reasoned perspective, what we should do with the you know potentially vast future that's ahead of us. And uh, I call these ideas, this idea of kind of exploring and trying to figure out um, different things, a, model, a morally exploratory society in the book with the kind of the limit case of that, I call the long, the long reflection, which is um, where it's like, okay, we've got to a state where uh, we've kind of solved the most pressing needs. Do we want to immediately rush to just settling, settling the stars with, um, whatever our favorite model views are. I'm like, no, we've got time. 
as we talked about at the very start of this podcast, we've got an awful lot of time. And that means we can, before we engage in any activities that lock in a particular worldview, such as space settlement or formation of a world government, then we really take the time to ensure that we've gotten, you know, gotten to the end of model progress, that we've really figured out all we, that we can. Are you of the mind that we should move more slowly with moral progress and our considerations for what we should do once we've got ourselves to technological maturity than in technological progress en route to get there? Uh, so I think with technological progress, how fast we should go is kind of tough. Um, where, you know, there are these reasons, I think, why at the moment going faster technologically is like a little better. It's not kind of that big a deal. I do think that if you can make model progress faster, you just want to go as fast as you can because <laughs> you make the everything better than the future. It's just that I think that real model progress might take time. Um, so this might be true for technological progress too. Maybe it takes, um, you know, I've, I've said that we can't go as fast as we're currently going, but assuming we slow, perhaps the whole project takes, you know, millions of years to come. I don't know. But the same might be true for morality as well. And unlike with technology, there's always incentive to build better technology. It gives you more power. Um, it means you can do more things, whatever your values are. Uh, so there's like always strong incentives to do that. With moral progress, that's not true. Um, if I'm, if I don't care, if I have all the power and I don't care about having a better moral point of view, there's no law of nature. There's also no real competitive dynamics that force me to have, get to a better moral perspective. And so what I'm really doing in kind of sketching out this idea of the long reflection is just to be, is to really say we need to keep working on you know getting better models getting better um values uh we don't want to just like jump into the first thing that we think is good you know early 21st century western liberalish kind of morality it's like no let's re like we can take our we can take our time before engaging in kind of any of these big projects there's less of a um degree of urgency with that although you can go as quickly as you want you can you can luxuriate and take your time perhaps in a way that you couldn't do with with technological change i yeah i mean i think for the world as a whole i think we could perhaps luxuriate with uh technological change at least and if we we get to a point of um safety so perhaps after the bioweapons you know within this, un perhaps in this unsustainable state at the moment, but perhaps we, you know, early 22nd century, then uh, maybe there aren't any nuclear weapons now, or we've got great protections against them. And perhaps we've not yet finished technological progress, but the particular level we're in is actually really very safe and stable. Maybe we just want to hang out there for a little while, <laughs> while we figure some model and political stuff out. Mm, so this is kind of like Bostrom's thing about how you can have, I can't remember the, the asymmetry in terms of technological development, but you can also do this in terms of moral versus technological development that you can kind of s keep on idling mm. while you continue to move on forward. And then let's say that you have your technology that allows you to catch up to that. I think it's it was Eric Weinstein that said, uh, we're gods, we're just shitty gods. Or it's Bostrom that was talking <laughs> about like, we're gods, but for the wisdom. And yeah. That, that yeah exactly we want to have yeah we want to accelerate wisdom as much as we can it just seems good in general um and then like i say i think that the particular circumstances at the moment that do mean that like ensuring we keep tech progress going um like is good as well but if you could guarantee me guarantee me that look even at a slower rate just now with it like 0.5% growth per year, 0.1% growth per year, but we're going to get model progress along the same time, then that would, you know, and assuming the tech progress is not going to stagnate, but just continue at that lower rate, um, you know, then I'd feel pretty good about that. How do you speed up moral progress? Have you thought about that? Uh, I mean, one is by, very hard question. So one is having like, 
kind of diversity of moral views um, and even societies as well. So uh, there was this kind of, you know, great ideal behind the United States that never really happened of all the different states would be like this vibrant, different culture. And uh, there'd be like a laboratory of democracy. And instead, it just like United States became a relatively uniform country. Um, but you could like aim for um, kind of global society that was like more like that. Um, I think we can also just invest more in, I know this is, I don't talk about this that much because it sounds so incredibly self-serving as a moral philosopher. Do you want to be a, more philosophers but, to be invested in? Yeah, I think we should, <laughs> like, how much of what the world society of uh, other sources gets spent on, um, you know, and not just moral philosophy, but other humanities, um, uh, you know, capacity for building capacity for empathy and so on. But really, the amount we spend in a society is, like, vanishingly small, like, 0.01%, even on all of the humanities as a whole. And that's like in your own life. Oh, how much time should I spend figuring out where how I spend the entire rest of my life as a teenager? Oh, yeah, maybe I'll spend like a day on it and that'll do. It's like, this, I don't know, it doesn't make sense. You're talking about your entire life. Similarly with humanity as a whole, um, you know, if it were the case, the kind of moral reflection and reasoning and progress in the moral domain had a hundredth of the status and prestige and investment that technology does, even though it's the moral progress that's contingent, not the technological progress. So actually it's the moral progress that we should be trying to safeguard even more. Um, well, yeah, then we would have to increase the number of moral philosophers like a thousand fold. Um, and honestly, I think it'd be a very good thing. Um, but yeah, perhaps there's some bias there. It would make my job a lot easier on the podcast as well. That would be a good externality. Exactly. Would have, so, yeah. And also, it would improve the quality as well. You wouldn't be getting idiots like me. You'd be getting the, <laughs> the very best people who are otherwise going into maths and physics would be uh, working on uh, improving our model understanding. Will McCaskill, ladies and gentlemen, if people have been compelled by the stuff that you've spoken about today and they want to find out more or work out how they could contribute to making our future a little bit less terrible, where should they go? Uh, so, obviously, um, I'd love you to read um, the book that I just wrote, What We Are the Future, um, which I think will be out at this uh, when the podcast is launched. Um, but then if you want to take action, uh, two big ways to take action. One is through donations. And I co-founded an organization called Giving What We Can that encourages people to give at least 10% of their income to the organizations that are most effective. And you can contribute to organizations that are trying to prevent the next pandemic or that are trying to safely guide the development of artificial intelligence um, or prevent a third world war um, and thereby uh, very significantly impact the trajectory of human civilization. The second thing, big thing you can do is uh, try and think about how you can use your career to do good in the world. Maybe you're already established, um, perhaps you're a podcast host and you should think about how can you get the um, you know most... Uh, important messages out there or you might be early on in your career and trying to figure out yeah what should the trajectory of my life be i uh, co-founded another organization 80,000 hours and it has enormous amounts of advice all for free online to try to help people make the best career decisions so that they can have the biggest impact mm -hmm. in particular biggest impact on issues that impact uh the long-term future and help build a better world for future generations um, they have online advice. They have a podcast, 80,000 Hours podcast, uh, and they also offer free one-on-one -on -one, um, advice as well. So, yeah, check out both Giving What We Can and 80,000 Hours and uh, my book, What We Are the Future Too. Uh, and take that all into account. You can make a truly enormous difference to the world for thousands, millions, or even billions of years to come. Well, I appreciate you, man. I love the work that you guys do. Uh, if this is the history of the future or the beginning of the history of the future or whatever, I'm glad that we've got people like you that are uh, guiding us in whatever way you can. Thank you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace. <laughs>